Thank you so much for this generous introduction. Thank you for having me here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really delighted to see also some old friends, friends of my family from my hometown, Sarajevo. I come from Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, a town uh, that has been historically known as um, Jerusalem of Europe. And these people say because we have, you know, centuries-long coexistence of uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews living side by side, or actually living together uh, for centuries. And even though you might have heard about Bosnia uh, through our recent war, um, it was not the ancient hatreds that constructed this war, but really a kind of constructed forms of nationalism and populism that is also really scary uh, kind of developments we are seeing parallel happening in the United States that could lead to some of these effects for me personally is really um, quite horrifying to watch the political developments, but let's hope it's not going to get there. Luckily, um, you know, groups like this uh, are coming together in these difficult times to discuss uh, and, and um, look at the ways in which we can all contribute that wars and um, misunderstandings between people do not happen. And, you know, from the experience of the Bosnian war, this has been something that has been really um, kind of framing my entire both identity and growing up, but also motivation for a lot of the work that I'm doing as an artist and later uh, my education in architectural history, um, to make a contribution um, in these places where I live and also through education uh, and, and conversations with young people, but also the broader public. So tonight I will present to you uh, a range of works uh, from my book, Mosque Manifesto, which you see here. I brought two of them. One I will leave in the library. Uh, the other I will give to my friends here. Uh, it is a, a book that connects uh, 10 years of my mosque uh, obsession, I would say different types of projects, research, and artistic investigations into the architecture and sociopolitical dimensions um, of that typology as a way of, uh, and really a lens, to talk about culture, to talk about differences, ways in which we can mediate cultural differences, and also intervene um, in critical political situations. So this book is designed, as you can see, it's, it's also an object. It's currently on display both as a book and an, as an object in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, the cover is inspired by uh, this Qibla compass, the compass that helps you to find direction of Mecca. But in this context, it's also um, you know, a compass that uh, provides a kind of discursive way finding and, and orienting yourself also um, in, in time and space, but also uh, in, in kind of society. And, uh, and then this manifesto has 10 points um, that are talking about different dimensions of, of mosques. I call them flocking, generic flocking, individual, local, fearless, egalitarian, liminal, inscriptive, convergent, and artistic. And I've written this manifesto, kind of extracting it from the different projects and situations in which I worked. Um, they are accompanied, the you know, manifesto is written as uh, from the perspective of the, as if the mosque could speak, as if it would be a person. And um, uh, then there are textual and visual essays. So I'll circulate these around. Maybe you would like to kind of touch them, play with them, and just return them to me afterwards if you don't mind. Okay, so I will not have time to, you know, go over the, all the different types of investigations, but we'll try to thread a story that I think could contribute on this broader discussion on, on difference and kind of how can we cultivate difference in the light of populism. So let me begin with a little quote from Hans Christian Strache from 2008. This is an Austrian uh, right-wing politician who, after visiting uh, Antwerpen, said this, today I did not seem to be in Europe, but rather in Kabul or Antwerpistan. 
indicating, and he said that when he saw uh, mosques in Antwerpen and, and was feeling alienated about it, and then he joined this anti-mosque uh, construction um, uh, protest, indicating that mosques are something that don't belong to Europe, that are alien to that uh, region, and uh, uh, so to say, constructing a kind of idea of, of, of alienation of that community. Contrary to these ideas proposed by Cities Against Islamization, uh, which Hans Christian Strache is one of the leader of, uh, which label Islam as a non-European religion, the presence of Islam in Europe is not just a product of uh, globalization and more recent processes of immigration. The very own European cultural heritage provides historical evidence um, against such claims. Islamic art and architecture, as we see here in these examples, the Mesquita Cathedral um, from now Cathedral, it used to be a mosque of Cordoba, but also uh, this beautiful mosque in Edirne, um, prove centuries-long presence and contributions of Islamic culture in Europe. Still, the debates about um, diversity, visibility, and presence of Islamic societies in the West um, are there, and they are becoming more violent and vocal. And very often, you know, 10 years ago, as I started working on these issues, uh, and since then, ever since, uh, carried out through architectural language and also are carried out on the body of the woman. So very often we will see examples of posters in these anti-mosque protests when people want to you know, construct a mosque in the neighborhood they'll be facing these kinds of posters. Uh, this was from a political campaign uh, against uh, minarets and also veiling in Switzerland. So for me, it was very interesting uh, kind of when you look at these signs, which notably embrace the legal language of the city. The traffic sign is actually you know, something where the city interfaces with the public giving the rules, so what are you supposed and not supposed to do in the city. There's a certain imagery that people have of what the mosque is or is not. Uh, and often, you know, these debates are kind of constructing the mosque as a kind of alien body in the European city. And so countering this kind of uh, European grammar of cities, I proposed this project called Cultural Fra Transfers, proposing to kind of in a playful graphic way to counter and expand the uh, iconography of European cities. So some of these signs are, um, you know, very abstract, working with Islamic geometry, but also a little bit with religious rules, what are you ex actually expressing with geometry. The others play with language, you know, like you can flee here, this has the shape of the mihrab, or our way, you know, whose way, your or mine, and which one is the right way uh, to these kinds of places. And this was produced for an exhibition in Holland, uh, which, uh, 2012, it was interesting, it was meant to be actually traffic signs in public space. Uh, no one wanted to print them. It was really difficult to actually find a printing company that would make the actual traffic signs. No one wanted to, uh, people were really scared of even being associated with printing, even though this was clear it was an artwork and everything. Uh, so that fear was so ingrained even in the kind of printing production companies. So in the end, we printed it ourselves and mounted them on cardboards and exhibited them inside of the, um, of the gallery. A couple of years after, I had to use the same signs against, in a legal process against the Freedom Party in Austria, uh, which um, you know, misused my work to argue as if, uh, if I would be saying something against mosques and kind of used my words to construct an argument that was diametrically opposite of what I was saying. So, uh, you know, sometimes you think art operates on a symbolic way, but as soon as you are outside of the gallery, and um, you are entering realms that are uh, quite, you know, very political and um, could have consequences that, that we have to deal with. I will talk more about these issues later, but 
I want to give you just a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so these traffic signs are one of the manifesto parts. First, I will um, talk a bit about the history of the mosque in the West and uh, where do these forms that we think make up the mosque come from, uh, like minarets and domes. Then uh, I will talk to you briefly about the kind of theoretical um, construct that I created on which I base a lot of my artistic work, which is in, in, in history and uh, uh, both also religion. Um, and based on these principles, I will then talk about different ways of playing with identity through spatial means and how then in the end we could um, actually create impact on the ground and create a cultural convergence through design where design can in fact bring people together and create, uh, create a transformation. Okay, so number one in the manifesto is generic, uh, where I'm saying that the mosque is saying, I'm not a building type, I am the world. I can be anywhere and everywhere. I'm infinitely scalable. These sentences come from uh, the very own words of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, who in the seventh century defined the mosque as the place of the world. So where I pray, that is the mosque. This is kind of in the, in the um, perception of the prophet, the definition of, of what the mosque is. It's a place of prostration. The very first mosque was the house of the prophet, which was a house, but also the seat of the first Islamic community, also political community. So it was also kind of the first parliament. And uh, it was like a fun this multifunctional space, so where he lived with his family, political things were happening, cultural events was happening. So a multifunctional place, an open courtyard with um, residential units here. And uh, this first prototype was, as Islam started spreading through the Arabian Peninsula, was the model for the very early mosques to be built, uh, embracing this kind of first prototype, but also merging it with architecture that was there before Islam has uh, emerged as a religion. We should, you know, bring this to attention that, uh, and this is a question that scholars really ask themselves, what is Islamic about Islamic architecture? You know, do we say Christian architecture? Do we say Jewish architecture? Why do we call something Islamic? Um, architecture never emerges in a cultural vacuum. Every new religion that comes is emerging in a certain context. So this is something that is very much, uh, you know, present in a, a major quality of Islamic architecture. Um, this dialogic dimension that Islamic architecture, and I call it especially the one that has, let's say, religious functions such as the mosque. Um, is an architecture that evolved in dialogue with pre-existing structures so that, um, you know, learning and adding new attributes to it. So that over time, you know, that first typology evolved into a multiple diversity of types that we can today not talk about a single mosque type, uh, but, you know, some say there are three, others say there are five. Let's say these three are the most present ones uh, because in the kind of main lands where we had longest Islamic dynasties that had a lot of money and patronage and time to build a lot of uh, buildings. Uh, three major types evolved. The uh, so-called hypostyle mosque, which is you know, a flat field with multiple uh, columns. Uh, the central dome mosque, like one big space with a dome above it, and then these courtyard mosques, or four in one mosque, as they call them in the lands of uh, Iran, uh, which like, are characterized by a large open courtyard and with these niches that are kind of semi um, covered. Still, you know, again, through this geographic dispersion over time, we have a number of different types, and it is really this diversity that I think is something that uh, is really important to keep in mind when we are looking for historical precedents that could inspire contemporary designs. 
despite the fact that we have this historical diversity in the Western context, when we are talking about mosque constructions, uh, the, there is a, this dilemma between these two types, the so-called nostalgia mosque, which scholars are talking about the kind of, you know, immigrant community looking back to their place of origin and transplanting the ornament that they know from home into the new cultural context without any modification. And this model is often rejected by the local dominant society saying, well, this thing is totally alien. You just planted it in from a different time period. It's problematic also for that idea of representing Islam as a culture that cannot change, that is something that is historic uh, and does not enter the dialogue with other cultures, uh, even though this prototype itself is inspired by Byzantine and Persian uh, models. And this model, which is favored by a lot of, you know, Western architects, saying, well, you know, let's, let's fo follow the kind of white cube, uh, minimal forms, and if you plaster a little bit Islamic ornament on it, that makes it Islamic. And often, um, not only is this kind of reductive uh, involvement of the, um, the ornament application itself, but also fails to give identifying means for the community that's building it. So we have a really like dilemma there. For me, both of these are problematic, both ends, because um, they kind of reduce the formal possibility of um, what we could be thinking about when we are talking about this really interesting spatial problem. And the result of that dilemma will be this kind of, this is what happened in Austria a couple of years ago, where you know, they commissioned an architect who wanted to create this kind of minimalist uh, white cube, but then the community wanted a dome, but then the dominant society said, no, 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 you can't have a dome visible or minarets. So they ended up, this is where the street is, so minarets are there, they don't serve any purpose, they are not allowed to project the call for, to prayer. The dome is there, but it's not visible, it has any, no representational means, so because they didn't want them to be visible from the street. So it's this kind of weird compromise solution where no one is really happy about. For me, this kind of problem that is, seems formal but is really also political was very interesting and I started researching where in the history uh, did these forms of the dome and a minaret as the identifying markers for the mosque uh, came to be established. So, Several scholars have argued this, and most prominently Nebahat of Jiolu, who historicized this phenomenon through um, three historical moments. So first is Orientalism, then industrialization, and colonialism. So in, in 18th century, uh, when Europe begins to you know, open itself to other cultures, they are looking to the east and finding all these interesting like mosque dome structures and start importing them as garden ornaments into European cities. So these first mosque-like structures in Europe never served any mosque purpose, but were just imported as these beautiful ornaments for European uh, gardens. And you see two examples um, blended here on the slides. Then in the industrialization, we um, get the application of the kind of exotic other style into the industrial architecture as a celebration of the you know, industrial age. So these are two examples from Germany of the steam-driven pump on the left and the tobacco factory in Dresden. Both buildings never erected to be mosques, but you know, the chimney is camouflaged as the minaret here. And it's funny now the community in Dresden wants to uh, take this building and transform it into a mosque, although it has never been actually built as such. And then in the colonial period, the colonial powers uh, <laughs> built in the uh, capitals, uh, those architectural styles of mosques that they, you know, from the lands that they conquered and for the communities that, that are colonized. It's interesting then in the post-colonial pe period then these uh, migrant communities are, so to say, reclaiming these symbols and saying like, Okay, 
this is now my thing. I'm reproducing these domes and minarets. It's a kind of reversal of uh, also a power and taking ownership back of that. But at the same time, reducing the formal possibilities of what the mosque could be. So in a way, as Nebahat of Chiolu, Nasser Abad, and myself have kind of collectively tried to criticize is that that embracing of these two symbols as the only identifying markers of the mosque perpetuates the colonial stereotype. When we look at the United States context, majority of, and also this is in Europe, uh, Western Europe, the trend that majority of uh, migrant Muslim communities have their mosques in a very private setting. They will, you know, when the community first come, they don't have much money. They'll transform a shop um, or an apartment into a mosque. You see here um, these kind of improvised, like religious equipment, the minbar and the pulpit, like made out of uh, transformed furniture. In the second and third generation, when the community establish itself also financially, uh, people start thinking about uh, you know, ways in which they can communicate their identity. And one trend that evolved in the West is the phenomenon of the Islamic center. So you'll have the mosque, but plus the mosque, you also have the cultural center, which is where you provide religious education, marriage and social you know, counseling, maybe burial services. Uh, things that are, so to say, not given by the dominant society, and that's a typically Western phenomenon. Stylistically speaking, there are different ways in which people go about signaling their identity and belonging. It gets really complicated when, uh, you know, in the West you'll have, it's not like homogenous Muslim community, uh, Muslims uh, uh, extremely diverse and, I mean, since second world largest religion, people come from all over the globe. So how do you stylistically signal, you know, kind of collective belonging of a Turkish and North African and, I don't know, Western European community? How do they uh, come together? In the U.S., we have a study here from Omar Khalidi who um, identified three trends of transplantive approach, again, the same one where you take one type of building from the, your homeland and transplant the same uh, style without any modification. Adaptive, where you start changing the material and form in dialogue with the local um, um, architecture or also of architectures of the communities that are represented in that place, like in the case of the Manhattan Mosque. This is Washington, D.C., the one on the left. And then Isna in Plainfield, Indiana, what he calls innovative, meaning that that type of architecture maybe draws more from the spiritual dimensions of uh, what is important for a space in which religious uh, uh, ceremonies are performed, but not necessarily uh, is creating any specific uh, kind of cultural reference. So for me, um, thinking about these dilemmas of what is generic kind of throughout, what defines the mosque as a mosque throughout history and time and space, but what is, so to say, locally specific was a question that haunted me for some time. And I did research both through history and stylistic comparison of 150 mosques from different time periods, important monuments across all cultures. And then also in the legal terms, how is that space defined? What does it need to have? So as I said, from a religious perspective, there is no stylistic um, definition. But there is a definition, and this is something I came up with, is kind of generative design principles, which define the mosque in conceptual terms, but not formally. And it can really be learned from this example of uh, worship at, uh, in New York, in Manhattan where uh, a bunch of people are worshiping together. They are oriented bodily towards Mecca. So it is this notion of directionality that in many mosques transpires into the shape of mihrab, the little niche that indicates the prayer direction. But as we know from Islam, you know, when you are in the desert, you don't know where is Mecca. You just turn somewhere with even that intention of directionality is already something that creates that spiritual connection 
of the community in Morshi. Other important aspect, purity and cleanliness. You see here people praying on uh, uh, some kind of carpets. So in Islam, as, as people are worshiping, they're touching with their forehead and with the nose, the ground. And uh, you know, for this reason, just practically speaking, it's important that the space is clean. But there is also the idea of um, purity. So mosques are not sacred spaces in the same sense that a Catholic church is a sacred space, a space that needs to be uh, dedicated through a special ritual. An equivalent of that sacredness is the idea of purity, um, meaning it's a kind of spiritual purity of space. So it's a pl space where you don't swear, where it can't be a toilet, it can't be you know, a cemetery. Uh, so that, that's also that purity, of also purity of mind. The minimal volume is kind of the minimal volume that the sp uh, body occupies while performing the prayer. So it's in this case, the volumes of these bodies here, that's the mosque. Programmatic variability means as long as they pray here on the street, they transform the street into a mosque. When they stop praying, it's, it's the street again. And then temporality would be another dimension that you say, okay, that could be ephemeral space. It's the ritual performance of the worship that creates the, the congregation, that creates the space um, and defines it as a mosque and then it can be the street again. And so this is something that, you know, this kind of worship together with a building would have in common, but they can look differently. So based on these principles, I had then went on to play with a bunch of different forms that allow me to comment or, you know, do different things uh, in reaction to complexities of different locations. So the generic mosque that I proposed um, this was my master thesis project, actually, was uh, the idea of this kind of modular space that works with Islamic geometric patterns, but also sensors where people are, let's say, worshipping. They would be triggering certain light sensors that start programming the space through color and light. But other secular functions can be f happening next to it, um, and it, they allow the switching between religious and secular functions. And the kind of beyond the generic, what would be local about this is you have this, let's say, tensegrity structure of the roof uh, that is activated in places where people are worshiping. But then depending on the, you know, where the, the, the angle of the sun, um, the shadows on the ground would be different. And that's something that, where the design becomes locally specific. And so, based on the kind of this idea, I then would go on to play in artistic realm as well. So, um, this was my first textile mosque, uh, talking about the minimal volume, saying, well, the minimal volume is the volume of the human body, but I'm also a social space. Congregation of many is better than one. I take place where bodies directed in space perform ritual prayer. I am when you prostrate to pray. And here, this piece is inspired, it's an artistic installation made of the three uh, textile circles inspired by Islamic geometric patterns. And the idea here is that you would have these patterns and they are in fact like mini mosques made of little slippers and pillows and for hands and head, those parts of the body that touch the ground when performing the prayer. The coloring is inspired by this transcultural symbol of the evil eye protecting you against the jealousy and kind of when someone wants something bad to you. And it would really like depict the mosque as this performative space. So in a secular function, um, this constellation would look like this, but if people would use it for prayer, they would disintegrate the pattern and reorient it to back and kind of create certain constellation uh, of a congregation. And this hasn't really been used for prayer, it's just a kind of potential for being able to do that, uh, the slippers. And then in the middle, there are these uh, compasses with prayer beads that people can share and take out. So one thing that I'm proposing here is this kind of idea of the individual 
space. I mean, notably, these congregational spaces, the point is congregation. Uh, but in fact, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm kind of shrinking the representation to the person. So I'm saying here, I represent Islam not as monolithic. I represent Islamic civilization not as stuck in past. Uh, and my intention here is to say, you know, what is this Islam, the West, the Middle East? We have these ideas of certain cultures or regions as if they would be, you know, one monolithic thing, whereas they are really made up of hundreds and thousands of people who have completely different uh, opinions and ideas, even within their own culture about, you know, how they should perform Islam and affiliate themselves with it or not. So one night I had, I had a dream, <laughs> and this was the dream. I uh, dreamt, uh, because I was obsessed with this idea of like the wearable mosque and the body being the minimal uh, mosque, which is a Quranic concept, in fact, um, that what if we could merge these clothes with prayer rugs and compasses, and I started playing with this so that you would, you know, what you need for worship, you would have some kind of suit and you would unzip parts of it and a little prayer rug would flip out of it in front. But because uh, mosques are also social spaces, you need to uh, allow for social um, interaction. So you would facilitate prayer of the next one. <laughs> and also maybe on the side. And so this, was, this could in fact go endlessly maybe hinting to this ideal sense of congregation that we have at Hajj uh, during the pilgrimage in Mecca, where the idea is that people, and that's where everyone is orienting themselves to pray, not because they worship the stone, but because this is the ultimate connection between all these people across the world, um, believing in the same thing, and in that very point, supposedly, are supposed to be equal, in front of God and, you know, circulating and performing these rituals uh, around the, the stone. But somewhere this idea of a uniform was not very satisfactory to me, especially in light of, you know, uh, stereotypes, prejudices, attacks on Muslims, particularly Muslim women who, uh, as we've seen in the United States after September 11, were beaten up, spit on, um, you know, insulted on the street, particularly because they are visible as Muslims uh, due to their headscarf. And so, you know, I wanted to, this kind of uniform cannot speak about these issues. And the issues that someone in America is facing is very different from someone in Pakistan or in Egypt. So how do you talk about these individual dimensions? And so he is where the, this is another artistic project that uh, is fearless. Um, it's where the mosque says, I give form to fearless speech. A fearless speech is a concept that Michel Foucault writes about that is um, about performance of democracy, that democracy only fu can function if the voice is given to those who are marginalized, threatened uh, in, in, uh, in our society. So, you know, what kind of form allows that uh, to happen? And so how can you kind of perform your identity in public space? And so based on the interviews uh, of Muslims after September 11, I created a series of photo montages that are visualizing the needs of people and what is happening to them. So it's this uh, kind of carpet, wearable mosque, which is survival kit, has uh, water to wash down uh, you know, yourself for the ritual prayer, but also the spit when you get spit on. Earplugs against insults, uh, first aid kit for people who are beaten, beaten up, communication devices, educational devices, religious devices, American constitution, <laughs> amulets, and uh, here was meant to be President Bush's at the time speech on religious tolerance. With, uh, which is powered by these photovoltaic cells, creating this effect of American flag. And then I put that all on the, this person, uh, together with some utensils recommended by Homeland Security Department, 
my gas masks and wearable satellite dishes. And then I, this is something I made just to kind of put over the top, a uh, camera that watches your back. <laughs> and of course, you know, no, no one would be able to run in this. So it's, uh, this is more like a, so to say, scenario. So the idea is then to then hide that and transform these wearable devices into bags that now and then spread paranoia spreading mes messages or, and also can call for prayer when it's time for worship. So they have Bluetooth. When two Muslims are close together, they start beeping. <laughs> and in some way, they would all be connected uh, in, in some kind of network, which I'm not sure, you know, who controls it because whoever is in charge of the satellites. So this was just a kind of play of through humor, visualizing a very sad reality of post-September 11 America, uh, which is repeating right now. And I didn't, of course, realize that piece because uh, it didn't make sense to actually create it uh, for the, you know, I'm making this distinction between what is a kind of scenario, what is the thing that I would actually perform in or that people would wear and what conversation is started with what. So the one that I actually made and sewn and, and created is this um, egalitarian piece when the mosque is saying, I materialize wishes, desires, and prayers. I mirror what you want to see. I uh, mirror what I want to be and what I want to be. And so uh, this piece is about you know, self-representation and expression and projections that we, you know, put on people, especially like Muslim women who are continuously being debated for wearing a veil, where all these different fears and power constructions are carried out on the body of the women. Again, we are witnessing in France women being pulled off their scarves and their burkinis um, as a sign of let's liberate these women not seeing that what they are doing is in fact uh, subjecting these women to um, yet another form of discrimination. And so uh, this idea of you know, speaking and the mirroring who is speaking on behalf of whom is uh, depicted in these or this was a piece about convertible veils where if we are talking about uh, female oppression in Islam, which certainly is there, it's not that there is not, but uh, it has nothing to do with will. Oppression exists in every society and we need to talk about it. There's domestic violence within Muslim communities, yes, but it has nothing to do with will. Um, let's talk about it in that right context. And so it's important there to also think about the different varieties and the cultural dimension, not necessarily religion, that is associated with, uh, with the veil itself. And so these convertible veils are talking about this, like there are some women who don't veil. The others veil, the others veil fully. It depends on their culture. So what I ended up then sewing is this, just a female prototype, a suit that I called nomadic mosque. And it's a, it's a chic female suit with uh, like skirts connected with pants and uh, and uh, blazer from which the collar you can take out the hoodie and that becomes the veil. Unfortunately, normally I would like jump in front of you and unfold this, but I've gained some weight. This was 10 years ago. <laughs> and um, so, and one of these pieces is still traveling. So now they are like doing their thing without me. But I exhibit them sometimes as, you know, posters like this, as like idea of calligraphy on the human scale. Or uh, I give lectures with them and start conversations. I visit synagogues and churches or mosques and create conversations around these wearable pieces. But they are, you know, really talking about the identity of a mo woman and also myself. Uh, you know, why are you identifying a Muslim woman primarily for her religiosity and not for her maybe professional identity or her cultural background or her, you know, taste. 
so this is talking about, you know, a kind of funky sense of fashion, but also the fluidity of identity, that um, identity is something that's not fixed in time, but something that is constantly changing and is in the process of becoming. And so with the same idea, the local comes into play. I represent Muslims of diverse backgrounds and diametrically opposite views. I embody identities as fluid, multi-layered, and local. So this is the Dion del Moshe, the Austrian version of this, which I developed when I was in residency in a little, very conservative uh, town in Austria where people are still wearing these beautiful, traditional Austri Austrian costumes. And uh, the mayor of that city gave me the, the dress of his daughter, so I modeled my uh, Dindal Mosque according to that with slight modifications. So inspired by the Catholic um, altar from the Church of St. Wolfka, it's a very well-known altar piece, that like unfolding altar that you know, they create this kind of yearly festivity of opening it and celebrating it. This mosque opens also into a space for three. And they are just small modifications. Normally this design in an Austrian traditional context, it's like a flat apron. Here it's like three little niches. And then the traditional uh, scarf, which women there carry on the shoulders. Notably also they were wearing headscarves. When you put it on the head, you hide your hair, but then you create these uh, hair bangs. Um, like it's a little play on what hair are we seeing. And then here I used local souvenirs, like uh, carabiners and Swiss Army knives, which immediately got interpreted by an Austrian journalist. It's like, they have weapons on the mosque. So here I was, of course, I was you know, putting this as a little provocation to see it's always what you see in this, the mirror. So for me, the motivation here was to embrace local souvenirs and materials. So everything is made of local materials. For person interview, interpreting this, it's weapons. Okay, finally, the convergent. We are coming to the uh, last project and the, the end. Is I'm a space for learning about connections and differences between cultures. I learn from pre existing knowledge, skill, and form. I can be syncretic and converge cultures without having them become the same. I respectfully cultivate difference. So, here I would like to show you the project that um, I worked partly on for the Islamic cemetery in Altach in Austria. Uh, a beautiful cemetery uh, built and completed in 2012 uh, 12, by Bernardo Bader, an Austrian architect. And uh, he, here is the prayer space of that um, cemetery that I designed. Bernardo commissioned me to work specifically um, with this religious context and find an aesthetic that could work um, with, with the piece. And so this uh, project was extremely <laughs> successful both in Islamic and non-Islamic context and was celebrated, received the Aga Khan Award for architecture uh, for a couple of major contributions. One was to provide the prayer space for, uh, and uh, you know, burial site for Muslims and communities that were not able to be buried according to Islamic right. Um, and the other one was to, to create really a community around the process of making architecture. And let me to tell you this a little bit of the story behind it. This is notably the second Islamic cemetery in Austria. This is the first one in Vienna. Um, this is part of a larger trend in Western Europe. Now you have these second, third generation Muslims, uh, migrant communities, who are starting to decide, well, it looks like we are not gonna go back home. And the process of shipping your dad is very complicated and it's very expensive. There is a whole business around it. You know, it costs like 3,000 euro to send a dead person to Turkey from Austria. Uh, so something needed to be changed. But even though Islam has been recognized as an equal religion to Christianity and Judaism in Austria since 1912, 
it has not been up to that point possible for Muslims to bury their dead according to the Islamic rite. Um, the cemeteries in Austria and the burial rituals are um, the matter of state regulations, and the state does it in a kind of Catholic way, and maybe atheist, but that's it. So everywhere in Europe you have now trends of people building cemeteries, but none of them has a very specific aesthetic. You know, It's just kind of seen as a functional space. You build something. You don't also need anything special. Uh, it's really people come together. They can actually pray in their mosque, uh, and then they just come bury. You do it very quickly. Some ritual washing needs to be performed, and, and that's it. Still, for this community, and here in Vorarlberg, in this part, westernmost province of Austria, a corner of three countries, Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, there are 39,000 Muslims, 10% of the local population. Majority of them come from Bosnia, Turkey, and Chechnya. And they've been, most of them, from especially the Turkish migrants, have been there since the 60s and 70s. And, um, you know, they have now decided that they, they needed this place. But, uh, of course, when communities decide something like this, there's a problem of site. No one wants to give you the land because they know politically they cannot uh, push, pull that out through um, uh, with their communities. So here, the mayor of the city of Altach, a <coughs> wonderful politician, we were all cheering afterwards, uh, that he should become the next Austrian president. Super open person and also someone who has very close ties to his community. He found a site. Uh, he's someone who is close also with migrants in his community and he saw the need. He found a site, it's kind of industrial site, uh, close to the former, uh, like to the Jewish cemetery and uh, next to a, a highway and then what was very interesting, the, the whole idea of the cemetery was initiated by a Jewish studies uh, historian, Eva Grapp here, former director of the local Jewish museum, who, um, she works a lot with migrants. She articulated that need, commissioned the Islamic expert at the Catholic Church to produce the study why they need Islamic cemetery. So now Jews and, and Catholics working and lobbying to the government and saying these guys need uh, a cemetery. And then they had to organize 95 communities that, you know, from all these different groups. They had no organizational structures, no kind of leadership within the community to work together on a shared concern and a shared project. Uh, competition was uh, publicized and Bernard Bader, local architect, won it with this minimalist design. That was very also groundbreaking. Usually communities are often in this nostalgia modus. But here they were saying, no, we want some cutting edge architecture. We want the local architecture. So they got local architecture. This guy is the expert in the local. He works, you know, he's one of these amazing architects who's like smelling the wood and like, you know, touching every little brick. And so there were these numerous tests on the site that were partly formal, really look what looks good in the rain and against this con context of the Bregenz forest. If you work on uh, this minimalism, uh, you know, all details really matter. And then they worked with local craftsmen. The region is known for woodcraft. For these guys, and again, you know, xenophobia ends actually with good craft. These guys, uh, they, they found this Islamic ornament super challenging. They were like, this is great, how can we do with any screws, you know, they, they constructed these ornaments with uh, pushing their craftsmanship to another level with this new formal challenge. And then another challenge was the soil. The soil was, um, you know, because they just got some random piece of land, it was a lot of clay, and that's not good for decay of the body. So they had to um, change a lot of land. And that was the only also point that triggered some negative press because the right-wing party was saying, like, our soil is not good enough for them, so we have to change it. <laughs> but it had really practical reasons. And then um, after nine years of negotiation, a new law had to be invented. 
So this is where this uh, lady, Eva Grapp here, who works between um, grassroots communities and the governmental bodies, lobbied and created a law that would allow, I mean, they had to kind of write down, like, what does Islamic burial right look like? They had to be described, written down, integrated into the uh, Austrian law. And actually everyone learned in that process. But to get there, you know, organizational structures needed to be formulated between uh, local Islamic communities. And partly it was also difficult because you had Sunnis and Alevis, Sunnis not considering Alevis being also Muslims, so you kind of had to negotiate internally, politically. But also, you know, how do you find a common aesthetic between Turkish and Chechen and Bosnian community? Everyone has a different taste or some other thing that they want to promote. So uh, Bernardo solved this with really this beautiful proposal. Everyone just went for this gorgeous um, design and that kind of unified um, everyone. And I'm blending in here some plans. So the plan is constructed in a way you would arrive here from the parking lot. Uh, these are facilities for ritual washing. And this is where the body is placed to wait until the congregation gathers. So people gather here. And um, worship prayer can be done here in the mosque. It's a little like prayer space with minbar uh, and mihrab that I designed. And then um, this is the open air area for graves. And that's conceived to be something that can grow over time. So for now they have uh, three or four of these like fingers and then theoretically it can be expanded later. So it was the idea of this kind of cultivated garden that connects people. For my design, I wanted to create specifically a kind of transcultural aesthetic that would connect people uh, through uh, spiritual dimensions. I embraced, so here you see a uh, Qibla wall, that's the wall that's facing Mecca and it's equivalent to an altar of a church, the most kind of holy area of the mosque, uh, indicating the prayer direction. I constructed this in form of three curtains. There's a window in the middle, and then a window with stainless steel mesh carrying wooden shingles, which are um, creating this calligraphic effect saying Allah and Muhammad. And here references are again to local architecture, shingle being something that they all use. The mihrab, this is how a traditional mihrab would look like, this niche indicating the presence of absence of the prophet, uh, which in some contemporary mosques, like here in the Grand National Assembly in Ankara, I found this beautiful reference, which also comes from Christian um, examples, where the uh, mihrab, this space of presence of absence, is constructed as uh, light. So the light comes in and the bodies are throwing shadows in space. And here, as the light comes in, and light being one of the names of God in Islam, really important spatial instrument in mosques, um, creates these shadows on the ground. When you come from the side, you see one picture, and then as you are standing still, looking towards the outside, to the world after, to the kind of doorway, to, um, you get the calm image, look towards the nature, and uh, the patterns also change during the day. This is one detail of how that looked like. So it's just working with these shingles that are oriented towards Mecca, and those that are more densely put, that do the calligraphic message. We also have some golden um, shimmer on on them. And so this, you know, it's really about staging the light. It's, um, it's a theater of light, which translate those important aspects of Islamic architecture, not as a kind of um, specific form, but as experiential, um, as experiential form, as a immersive cultural space where you can smell that wood, you are in the light, and uh, you sit on the carpets, which were 
creating depth in space. They were handwoven by Bosnian women who survived these uh, concentration camps and uh, torture. And so there is also a symbolic dimension in acknowledging the need to kind of support these communities and their healing, whereby the notion of weaving is uh, the notion of also trauma recovery. You arrive to this mosque also again through this play of light from uh, the local craftsmen. And then here what happened was you know, much more important, this coming together of the political uh, elites and the communities finally speaking the same language, acknowledging the need um, to formulate organizational structure of migrant communities where architecture, because it's a collaborative making process, creates the community and creates legal dimension. And now, um, you know, people are pilgering to see this place, mainly non-Muslims who want to learn about these migrant communities, their religion, because they really like the architecture and they are not afraid of it. And for the Muslim community themselves, it was also the cemetery represented the shift in the idea of homeland, that homeland is not anymore the place where you came from, but where you want to find your final resting. Thank you.